Welcome. Let's discuss the theory recap for week number 10 of dynamics. This week we introduced the concept of vibrations and we thought about how to describe vibrations of systems with a single degree of freedom. The first thing we did to this end is we introduced a new kinetic concept which we called Lagrange equations. And this was nothing else but a new shortcut or a new tool, as I said, in our kinetic tool set. That's the Grange equations, to be exact. And this is nothing else but a shortcut to give us the equation of motion, or the equations of motion of a system. And the idea behind this is that we work with the kinetic and potential energy, which we introduced a long time ago. And I hope you can hear me, because someone is drilling all morning in the background. And with those, we define the Lagrangian, which is nothing else but the difference between the kinetic energy, T, and the potential energy, V. And with this Lagrangian, the, the Lagrange equations become simply d by dt, the time derivative, of the Lagrangian differentiated with respect to qi dot. Let me explain in a second what these are. They are generalized degrees of freedom, minus dl by dqi. And this was equal to, if it's a conservative system, equal to zero. If they are non-conservative forces, then we had to add this qi non-conservative. And let me quickly explain what these terms are. So the, the Lagrangian is defined like this. And these qi, these are what we call our generalized degrees of freedom. These are our generalized degrees of freedom. And think about them this way. We can describe the motion of a system in many different ways. What we have to do is we have to pick an independent set of variables that describe the motion, an independent set of coordinates, so to speak. If you have a particle rotating, of course it has some 2D or 3D position in space, but you can describe its motion much more efficiently, for example, by one angle in 2D or by two angles in 3D. Or if you have some complex motion on a trajectory, oftentimes you can break down the motion to only one or two or three or a small number of really independent degrees of freedom. These are what we call the generalized degrees of freedom. And so what this means is you simply take a Lagrangian, you plug it in here, and you take these derivatives and you end up with as many of these equations as you have generalized degrees of freedom. One for each generalized degree of freedom. And this is the system of ODEs or, uh, that we have to solve uh, in order to find the motion of the system. Now, if we have non-conservative forces, then we have a right-hand side here. And this thing we should quickly define because, as we showed in class, this is nothing else but the sum over all j from 1 to n. Now we need the real non-conservative forces in the system, f non-conservative, and these are forces that come from friction, from dash spots, from damping, from anything of this type, times the derivative of drj. This is the point of attack of this force in the real system, differentiated with respect to the little qi, the generalized degree of freedom. And so, in a general system, moving in 2D or 3D space, you will have non-conservative forces if, for example, you attach your particle to a dash pot or if there's friction. And these are general forces in 3D. And the point of attack of this force is also a point in 3D space. So, when we do this transform over here, what we end up with is a scalar force. And this is nothing else but um, the force which is conjugate to this degree of freedom. I think in class I call this the restoring force, or pullback force, or something. So if you change your generalized degree of freedom qi by a little bit, this is the resultant force uh, that is associated with that change of the system. And this altogether is what we call the Lagrange equation. If there's one degree of freedom, or the Lagrange equations, if there are many, because then we have many of these. Now, there's one special case that we also considered, which is the case of equilibrium. Because if we are in equilibrium, that means we have no dynamics, which means the kinetic term here disappears, and T is zero, there's no kinetic energy for an equilibrium, which means we end up with something very simple, namely dV, this simply becomes minus minus plus V, by dQi equals QI non-conservative, and this is nothing else but static equilibrium, and if in addition we're in a conservative system, then we don't have these non-conservative forces, which means dV by dQi is simply zero. And this admits a very nice reinterpretation of what equilibrium is, because apparently an equilibrium is nothing else but a stationary point in the energy landscape. And the example I always show in class is, you know, if you have some kind of mountain landscape which goes up and down the hills, and we can think about the potential energy associated with this, 
which is some potential energy V. Of course, V depends on the height of the system. Um, if this is the height, but well, we could describe this, for example, by generalized coordinates Q, which runs from here and simply defines the position of the particle in this Q direction. Then H becomes a function of Q. The potential energy would simply be MGH of Q, for example. And what this tells us is that if it's a conservative system, for example, a particle in some potential energy, mountain landscape, then all those where the first derivative vanishes, these are equilibria. That means this point here, this point, this point, this point, oh, I should have drawn less, this, this, and this, all those points where the first derivative vanishes. These are stationary points, and these are points in equilibrium. If you put the ball right there, it will stay there. That's what we call an equilibrium. So all of these guys here are equilibria. But we differentiated in total three types of equilibria. Namely, first of all, there are those where we are in the valley. Right? And these are stable equilibria. And that means if you put the ball there and you slightly perturb it, it will always return to where you start, namely the minimum energy. And then there are the other ones, which are these over here. Oops, not this one. Darn it. This one. With the unstable ones. If you put your ball on top of a hill, you slightly perturb it, it will roll down to the next valley. These are unstable equilibria. And in principle, there's a third option, which is if you're in a settled point, in that particular case, you would be in a so-called metastable equilibrium. And so the condition for an equilibrium is the first derivative vanishes. If you want to verify if the equilibrium is stable or not, all you have to do is, well, remember a functional analysis to see if it's a minimum or a maximum. What we do is we compute the second derivative. And we check if it's positive, and if so, then that means we're in a minimum, which is a stable equilibrium. If it's negative, that means we're in a maximum, which means this is an unstable equilibrium. And of course, equality is the special case of metastability, where you're somewhat in between those on a settled point. And that's essentially all we discussed in terms of Lagrange equations and equilibria. And uh, we can apply this to all kinds of systems. Now, keep in mind that, of course, these apply to as many degrees of freedom as you have. This is a simple 1D system. The same applies in higher dimensions. There you would have n equations for n unknowns to describe your equilibrium. And you could also find out if a system is stable or not by taking second derivatives, which for you know, a higher dimensional system means you would have to check if the Hessian, the matrix of all second derivatives, is positive definite or negative definite or uh, why not? All right, this uh, section of the lecture notes where you can look it up. Um, we hardly ever have these examples in class, to be honest, but that's how we would do it in general. Now, the one thing we went, then went on to do is we discussed vibrations. And vibrations are a special type of motion that come from a particular equation of motion. And, of course, we can use the Lagrange equation to derive equations of motion. I usually abbreviate this as EOM. And the most general equation that we found was M times X double dot plus c times x dot plus k times x equals f of t. This is kind of the prototypical equation for linear vibrations. Vibration, keep in mind, is nothing else but you take your system and you perturb it at small amplitude about a stable equilibrium. That's how I define vibrations or linear vibrations. It's a perturbation about a stable equilibrium of small amplitude. So your system keeps oscillating around that equilibrium, that's what we call vibrations. And this here is the prototypical equations for all linear vibrations in a single degree of freedom, right? Here we only have x as our unknown. I could also use q. Um, this is the force applied to the system. And you can picture this as a particle, you know, of mass m, spring of stiffness k attached to it, a dash pot with constant c attached to it, and in principle, there could also be a force f of t applied to it. This is how one can interpret this kind of equation. Um, the, the thing here is that if you want to know what x of t is, we have to solve this ODE. That's what we call the equation of motion. And this, in general, is a bit more complex. The one thing we did is we slightly rewrote this. We normalized it in order to write this as x double dot plus 2 delta x dot plus omega squared x equals, and on the right hand side we have f over m, something like this, which we may also call little f, it's just a force per mass, and in this equation we identify a few things, in particular these omega 
zero that we have here, this is nothing else but what we call the eigenfrequency of the system. And uh, this delta is associated with the damping of the system. And we introduced, among others, d, which is a damping ratio, and that's nothing else but the delta normalized by omega zero. And this tells us how much damping we have in the system relative to the eigenfrequency of the system. And the first case we discussed this week is a free vibration. So we have that special case of a, what we call a free vibration, which simply means that there's no applied force. So we don't force it, but we just let the system vibrate however it wants. In this particular case, there's no right-hand side, f of t equals exactly zero for all times. And in this case, we have to solve this equation equals zero, which is the prototypical equation of motion for a free vibration. And we identified a number of solutions to the system for the particular case of a free vibration. I don't want to write all of them down, so I'm simply going to show you how we put it onto the formula sheet. So what you see down here are the four possible cases that we discussed in class. For an undamped vibration, that means d is zero, or delta is zero, or c is zero, this term simply is not there. I could cross this out. In that particular case, we just have a harmonic oscillation with cosines and sines. And we have two different ways of writing this, where either a1 and a2 are the unknowns, or a and phi zero are the two unknowns that we have to solve by using the initial conditions. It's a second order equation in time, which means we have two initial conditions, and these are exactly the ones to find the two unknowns in this equation. Next, for overdamped vibrations, that's the case where you have a lot of damping. D is greater than 1 or delta is larger than uh, the eigenfrequency. In that case, we have a solution which looks like that. And there's the critically damped vibration where D is exactly 1 or delta is the same as omega 0. Happens extremely rarely in practice, uh, but you know, has its own mathematical solution. And then finally, this is the most common case we'll ever run into, which is the so-called underdamped vibration. So you have a little bit of damping in the system, but it's not huge. And in this particular case, the vibration is again harmonic, cosines and sines, but the first term that we see in here is e to the minus delta t. That gives us an amplitude that decays over time that becomes smaller and smaller. And note that the vibrational period here is a bit different. The first case vibrates at omega zero, undamped free vibration. The underdamped case also vibrates, but with omega d, where omega d is a modified eigenfrequency, a damped eigenfrequency, if you will. It's the square root of omega, not the eigenfrequency squared, minus delta squared. So if delta is zero, we just recover automatically what we have here. But if delta is non-zero but small, this is the solution. And just to show you what the solution looks like, this is the undamped case, and in this particular case, the vibration period that's shown up here is nothing else but t equals 2 pi over this eigenfrequency omega zero. There are two curves in here, blue and red, and they're simply there because based on the different initial conditions, so based on where you start and with what velocity you start, you'll get different curves. They always look like the one shown up here, but you know they can look different, they can be shifted uh, in their uh, in their face, but also in their amplitude because of the initial conditions. Then there's the underdamped case over here. Underdamped is the last point where, as I mentioned, the amplitude decays over time. You can see the vibrations become smaller and smaller, while the period, the frequency, stays constant. But this one is the damped frequency, so here the TD is larger than the original T because omega D is different from omega zero. Then we have the overdamped case, which is shown down here. And like in the critically damped case, in these two cases, the vibration will simply disappear very, very quickly, and there's no real oscillation. So the only real vibrations we see is in the undamped and underdamped cases, which we see most frequently also in practice. If you ever run into any of these four cases, all you have to do is check which of the cases is the right one. You can check this by computing d, or simply comparing delta to your eigenfrequency. And then you can use the solution as is from the formula collection. To get those, you need to get the equation of motion. And once you have the equation of motion in this general form, always write it as x double dot plus something times x dot plus something times x equals right hand side. If you have this form, you can simply read out the eigenfrequency and the delta. There's no need for further computation. Once you've read, arrived at this equation, you can read those terms out. And that's essentially all for this week. Free vibrations, Lagrange equations. Next week, we'll move on to forced vibrations, when we put the force back in, and then what happens if you have more than one degree freedom. With this, thanks and ciao.